Today, Brian Hicks has agreed to do an interview with me, which is which is great. Um, Brian is the creative director on the Daisy Standalone project at Bohemian Interactive. And how long have you been the creative director there, Brian? <laughs> Uh, creative director role, but a, a little over a year and a half, maybe cl closing on closing on two years. Um, I joined the project uh, summer of 2013 as the producer, and as Dean started looking at what was next for him, um, I ended up pulling a lot of double, triple, quadruple duty, and um, it just it kind of made sense. At a certain point, I was, you know, I was holding the producer title, but I was really focused on the high level vision of the game, and it just made sense to just make the, the title swap and uh, get somebody in there, in the producer role that was focused on production. So I've got a series of questions, and the first question um, is from Jackster. How did you learn about the Daisy mod, and how did you end up being a dev for the Daisy standalone team? So I guess that's actually a pretty good, pretty good question from Jackster, right? Yep. All right. Well, Jackster, um, I was actually, uh, see, it was early, early 2012, uh, right about when the mod first blew up before there were mods of the mod. And, uh, I had been at the time I was working over at Microsoft and I told myself after, I think I actually saw an article in PC gamer about Daisy mod. I'm like, it mentioned that it was an alpha and I was like alpha and a mod, you know, I, I deal with this stuff at work. I don't want to deal with this at home, but I was really curious. And, uh, Twitch, Twitch was still very young, but uh, I had heard about Twitch. I think I had heard about it through, uh, PAX because it was, you know, it was the first year that they had, uh, um, picked up uh, doing some video uh, work for the show itself, streaming it, that is. And uh, yeah, so I'd heard about Twitch and uh, I thought you know, it, was, it was, it was I don't know, it was a Thursday or a Friday. I didn't have much going on. Maybe it was a three-day weekend. And I thought, you know, I'm going to go check to see if there, anybody's playing this Daisy mod on Twitch. And then I could at least, you know, see it be played, watch it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I started watching several streamers. Uh, let's see, I started watching uh, Deegan. And uh, I started watching uh, QN Omnikai, mm -hmm. and uh, um, oh man, I can't believe his name escaped me because he was a Survivor Games champion. Um, Puddin, yeah. Uh, and I don't think three of them actually really stream that much anymore. But I started out watching them, and uh, uh, through me sending, I think, uh, Twitch DMs to Kai. Mm -hmm. Um, I ended up uh, playing Daisy Mod with him and uh, streaming it. Him and uh, Soma, uh, who was Soma Plays back then, is now just Soma. He works for Twitch. And uh, uh, QN Lu, who uh, now works for Bahamian Interactive on the Survivor Games Project. And uh, you know, a couple others, uh, Bike Man uh, is probably the most active person uh, that still streams out of that group. I started uh, started streaming and playing with them, and then um, <clears throat> I got into modifying AZ Mod uh, with a good friend of mine. Goes by the name uh, the online name of Ian Banks, um, who lives over in Perth. Mm -hmm. uh, we got together and we started working on uh, one of the first Daisy mods, not the very first Daisy mod mod, but like the second or third, uh, which was Daisy Taviana. And uh, while I was working on Daisy Taviana, I was also uh, working with uh, <clears throat> the QN guys I was streaming with on an event called the Survivor Games. Originally started as the Hunger Games. Yeah. And uh, Dean sat down with us at PAX of 2012, mm -hmm. PAX Prime, and uh, uh, kind of advised us of the, you know, this is a big thing, guys. Like, the numbers you guys pulled in are impressive because at that, at that day and age, I mean, you know, like a big league tournament would get like 70,000 people. Twitch was much smaller. Yeah. Um, and he's, he, he, he gave us the advice that, you know, we needed to look at the big picture with the survivor with the hunger games at the time. And he actually came up with the name survivor games. Um, and we, we moved forward with that. So I was running the survivor games, uh, esport event, which was taken off on Twitch. It's doing fantastic. Yeah. And, um, I was also working on Daisy Taviana, which was very near and dear to my heart, which is like a very true to the original early Daisy mod uh, scope and, and mechanics, but placed within the, the Taviana Island by Martin Bauer. And uh, through that, through all of that, as I mentioned, I, I got to know Dean. Yep. And um, early on, 
uh, when there was first, you know, start rumblings of talk of uh, standalone. Uh, since I was, my office was just down the hall from uh, Chris Jarla, the at the time portfolio manager for um, what is now ID at Xbox. I would, uh, I I do this kind of go between. I'd email Dean. Uh, trying to give him advice on like what he should request for Microsoft, like what they can give him, what they'll say and what he can push on. And then I'd go down and talk to Chris and say, this is what you need to say to Bohemia. Cause I was trying to break down the walls. There was a communication disconnect between Bohemia interactive and Microsoft and throughout going back and forth and talking about that. Um, while, while Dean was uh, on Everest, I believe. And, and as soon as he got back from Everest, I sent him another uh, recap email and I'm like, uh, you know, on, on what was going on with Microsoft. And I kind of just tossed out there at the end. I'm like, you know, you should just fucking hire me at this point with all this stuff I'm doing. And uh, Dean said, uh, I'd hire, hire you in a heartbeat. Can you come to E3? So uh, I went and I talked to the um, senior producers on the project I was working with and my direct manager at Microsoft. And I said, uh, this is what's going on. And they were incredibly supportive. They said, well, you know, you've got several launch titles for the Xbox One um, and we're doing that reveal at E3. So why don't you just go ahead and work the Microsoft booth at the show and attend your interview in the meantime? So uh, they sent me out uh, to Los Angeles and uh, I worked uh, both the Twitch and, and Microsoft booths because I had games being shown on either either side. And in between that, I went and did my uh, my interview with the CEO of Bohemia and, and Dean. And from there, you know, they requested, they're like, this sounds great. Uh, can we get you out to, to Prague for a working interview? And uh, I talked to my managers at Microsoft. They were, again, incredibly supportive. And, uh, yeah, I, I took a couple weeks off from Microsoft and flew out to uh, the Prague and worked for a couple weeks in uh, Meshek, which is a small village about 20 kilometers outside of Prague, mm-hmm. where the Arma development is based. <laughs> And from there, yeah, it was uh, after the two-week uh, working interview, I sat down with the CEO. He was really happy with what uh, what I had done, and, and they made the offer, and I accepted. Wow. that that That's, I mean, I had no idea how deeply involved you were with it from very early on. And it's really interesting that you were watching. Yeah, it consumed me. Yeah. <laughs> it, it consumed me. Yeah, I mean, and because uh, that leads into the next question. Um People often compare you to Dean Hall, and they talk about Dean's vision for the game. Mm -hmm. How is that your vision for the game? Because obviously having taken over from Dean Hall, um, people were kind of expecting you to do the same thing. But is that how you see your role? How, what have you brought to that position? Well... You know, early on, uh, you know, when Dean was still in the project, um, often I would, uh, you could say, put my foot in my mouth when it came to how firm I was on Dean's vision mm-hmm. and what the game was. Uh, there were situations like um, I was once quoted saying that um, the infected will never be as much of a threat as another player. And I still hold true to that, but a lot of people took that as me saying, that uh, that will never have good infected like ever, um, and uh, you know Dean actually had to come to my rescue a couple times and say you know the the thing about Brian is he's what we call a true believer <laughs> like he firmly believes in every aspect of Daisy and to this day I I still firmly believe that um, it doesn't matter how advanced your AI is at all um, the the end all be all is that with another human you can never truly know what their their intentions are what's going on behind their monitor you know yeah. uh, with AI it doesn't matter how advanced it is you can with time and effort learn the ins and outs of the AI you yeah. can know exactly what to do in every situation but with humans you can't you because you you can never truly know what they're thinking I mean you could sure you can take the approach of everybody's a threat so just shoot everybody but then you rob yourself of the greatest part of Daisy which is that human interaction the the, the it's it's when you play Daisy it's not the uh, it's not the infected 
that make your hands shake and your heart beat faster. It's the the sheer risk of losing all of your progress to this unknown element. You don't know how good this other person is. You don't know whether or not they have friends, whether or not they have a, a surprise grenade in their yeah. pocket. You know, you yeah. can never truly know. So when it comes to to me and and the vision uh, uh, for Daisy that that Dean had, um, I, I think through time I've actually backed off that a bit because Dean's vision. Uh, was and is significantly more hardcore than I'd say 99% of the player base of Daisy wants. I mean, we're talking about a vision where Dean wanted the simple act of finding a can of food to be the high high point of your day. Like when when we sat down with Mark, uh, the CEO, uh, the vision from from day one when I first joined the team and there was like four people on it was – that every action should be a serious uh, serious point of uh, contemplation for you. When you see another player, you should be considering uh, everything from do I want to bother wasting uh, the limited ammunition I have on this person? Do I, you know, should, can this person help me? Like every element should be thought out. And just finding basic food should be huge. And the fact of the matter is, is as fascinating and compelling as that gameplay is, it's very, very, very slow. That is a very slow burn. And um, <clears throat> if nothing else, the last you know three years or so of early access has shown that you know the players they want that interaction. It needs to be valuable interaction because you can't have it happening every ten seconds, else it loses its allure. Um, but it it needs they they need that player interaction. Uh, you know most most folks don't want to spend all day to find a I don't know let's say an AKM. Mm. They, they there needs there's a sweet spot somewhere there between finding an AKM 20 minutes after you spawn mm. or finding an AKM six hours after you spawn. Um, and for me, it's it's been trying to maintain that hardcore vision, but reach a level of playability. And when you when you deal with uh, a 256 square kilometer map and 20 plus thousand items spread over you know hundreds of thousands in some case millions of potential spawn points and 60 players even though you know I desperately want it to be a lot more yeah. um, it's it is it is an incredibly difficult thing to get to that right spot yeah. uh, so for me it's it's for for me I think what I brought uh, to it I guess to answer this question I've been rambling on for quite some time is is coming to grips with the reality of game design versus punishing simulator and finding a balance between the two and let me tell you that is not an easy task when the engine's being developed alongside it and all these mechanics that we set forth we want to do you know the soft skills the base building every every design decision we've made is it has to 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 take a pause and wait for the technology to catch up to enable us to do that, and and to still maintain a playable game on these legacy systems, it's it's difficult. So, yeah, for me, it's it's about finding that balance between playability and punishing. Yeah, and I I think um, you know from my own experiences from watching YouTube and and Twitch, I think that that has been the most painful thing for players to kind of accept. You know that there is there has to be this balance. To, to exist and I think that that has largely landed on, on your shoulders Brian and I think that to a certain extent people blame you for that particular thing and I think they're wrong to do that but you know that must have been really difficult to sort of come to terms with that, that actually you're battling with this perception rather than some of the actual content necessarily How, how's that how's that affected you as you've kind of moved on over the last six months with it well you know I, I'd have to say um the, the most difficult thing is is just is knowing internally what Peter and the rest of the team have ready to go. You know, have the it's been whiteboarded. the The scope of the project was locked years ago. Um, just knowing that we we have all this stuff we want to do, we're going to do. Um, but we have to wait just as much as the players have to wait for it for the technology to catch up. And that's got to be the most difficult part of the job is, you know, people saying, you know, why can't, why don't you just do this? Or you should roll out this feature. And we're like, this is great ideas. We're going to do these things, but it, we have to wait for the technology to be there to enable us to do it. And, you know, things like 
like I said earlier, you know, soft skills and, and player beards and air, aerial vehicles and base building, electricity, all this crazy shit that we want to do. Um, you know, the decision had to be made in both re in resource management and, and future proofing, for lack of a better term, that this is to be done on the new technology. And, and you know, as a developer uh, and, and working in design, that is the most frustrating thing. It would be so much easier if it wasn't in early access, right? And we were just, we just had to deal with this stuff internally. Mm -hmm. But the fact that, you know, we see people and they're running into the same limitations and the same problems we know are there um, that are on the legacy technology um, and, and trying to communicate to them, it will be fixed. It's just, we have to get this base tech right. And, it, you know, if I could go back and change things, mm -hmm. um, if I, not that I had any decision or any influence in the decision to go on early access, but if I, if I could, the, the early mandate would be, we don't hit steam until the tech is ironed out. But unfortunately, you know, you can't go back and change time. And even if I could, they wouldn't listen to me anyways. It was a, it was a corporate uh, level decision to go on early access. So. Right, yeah. At, at the time, that was the thing to do, wasn't it? That was yeah, I mean, I, I, under, I understand why they did it. Mm. You know, if we play devil's advocate here, uh, there was probably a lot of concern about getting to market before the market got saturated because you know, the whole thing with War Z had happened and everybody was, seemed like everybody and their mother was looking at Daisy Mod as an example of where to go next. Mm. And, you know, I get that. I understand why they did it. And in to a to a you know to a, a slightly lesser degree, um, entering early access did you know provide the project with the funds to inc you know to address the technology issues we might not have been able to do if we hadn't. Yeah. Um, so yeah, hindsight's twenty twenty. You know. <laughs> yeah, of course, of course. Um, okay, so um, I've got a section here called direction of the game, and I've put uh, mm -hmm. sort of some specific uh, questions together. Um, now we covered the kind of like the history. So my first question here is, what would you say is the direction of the game? E.g. survival, PvP, or both? What, what, what do you feel without, kind of what's your, what's your instinct? Is it more PvP now, as you were talking about it a bit there? Well, there's a big difference between, you know, the intent of uh, design's direction, which, you know, they're all aimed and working towards beta and beyond and all the technology there. Mm and the reality of gameplay right now. And, you know, while I think there are some, you know, some compelling uh, mechanics on the survival side, but, uh, you know, they're not by any means mandatory at this point. Um, <clears throat> I'd say from a design perspective, where we'd like the game to go, obviously we're aiming at that survival um, open world, mm -hmm. but attention is paid towards the implications of PvP, because let's be honest, most of the compelling content created from DayZ Mod was emerging gameplay around PvP. Mm -hmm. and, and PvP informs those survival decisions you have to make. Mm -hmm. So while the mechanics are, are, are put in um, so that you know a, someone doesn't have to PvP to survive, um, they should always be complementary to the, the, the PvP elements. The PvP, uh, as I said earlier, PvP should be happening and constant and frequently, um, but it's it's PvP that should influence the decisions you make based around survival. I think most people feel the PvP element of Daisy was groundbreaking. You know, palm sweating. I think that's really what mm -hmm. drove Daisy, mm -hmm. and the survival elements are are really amazing. But I think that generally people do. I mean, you still have to look at the player unknowns battlegrounds. You know. I mean, that has taken what you could argue is that combat moment from Daisy and turned it into an arena along with H1Z1, you know, but... Um, oh, most definitely, yeah. You know, Battlegrounds is, is a perfect example of just taking the PvP slice out of a game like Daisy or Arma and focusing specifically on that. And, you know, hands down, obviously it works, obviously. Yeah. Between our sales and their sales, it's clear that works. Yeah. Um, and at a certain degree... Um, you know, one could say that, uh, you know, why not just focus on that? There's clearly money to be made there. Why bother with the survival stuff? And it comes right down to, you know, those working on the game. Um, <laughs> our paychecks are not influenced by how many copies we sell. And I, th I think that's a good thing. Like our drive is not money. 
our drive is to get that game out there that we wanted to play from day one that we all envisioned. For me, Daisy is more than just PvP. Daisy is an, a living, breathing world. You step inside you know, your character's shoes and every decision, whether it be you know, struggling to find a sailing bag for your friend who's near death, like I just recently spent a couple hours playing with a streamer by the name of Potato, mm-hmm. and uh, I spent several hours just trying to get him back from the brink of death. Yeah. And it was a brink of death from purely the survival elements. Uh, you know, he hadn't kept an eye on his food and drink, and they got to a position where it was suddenly a serious problem. Yeah. And he didn't have things like saline and IV starter kits. He didn't have water purification tablets, and his friend was running around tr- bringing him. Uh, pond water in a, a pot mm-hmm. and you know when, when you're below a certain mark on your health and blood there's a chance for cholera there and his friend got cholera his friend died from it and left him <laughs> just unconscious in the middle of several grad yeah it's and i spent these scenarios which make it so good aren't they basically yes yes you know i spent several hours of what i consider to be fun gameplay trying to find these supplies and nurse him back to health and once i got him back up then it was the quest to find the right uh food uh, types of food and water uh, to get him back healthy, give him water purification tablets, make sure he had antibiotics when I left him. That was the the whole point is to, is to combat these uh, environment elements that he wasn't paying attention to because he was, as much as I love Dato, he was approaching it like it was uh, Battlegrounds yeah. where he didn't really have to focus on that stuff. It was only the gameplay. And, you know, he didn't focus on it. He almost died. But, uh, you know, through through nursing that survival element, I got him back to health. I got him uh, equipped to handle the, uh, the uh, risks he would face uh, there forward. And whether it be, you know, uh, things like making a camp or a base with uh, your friends on your favorite server and then defending that against other folks or hunting other players' camps or trying to lock down a town and run an, an RP group out of that. I mean, there's so much more that, sure, it might not it might not sell, you know, an additional million copies to focus on base building or focus on soft skills, but it, it enriches what that open world living, breathing real world uh, of Daisy is. And I, I think that it is that, um, it is nursing those elements that will bring us closer to, you could say, Dean's vision. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so this is a question. This. This is something that's popped up uh, on uh, lots of my videos, um, people making statements. Okay, and so here's, here's the question. It appears that the development has slowed. Is this the case or are the problems bigger? Most, most definitely. Uh, you could say de- development as far as the pace in which consumer see builds is slowed, but that's because we're at that point now where we cut it off. We said we're not doing any more stuff on the old technology. We are focused on beta and 1.0. And that means that the issues that are being addressed are massively bigger than just, you know, making a new model uh, of like a firearm and making sure it's animated in the old system and configured and, and just set up in the loot economy and, you know, sounds are created for it. Those are, I'm not going to say they're small, but they're significantly smaller uh, goalposts than going in and replacing the entire animation system and player controller and user actions. That is that is a massive element. That is the spine of the game that's being replaced. So, of course, uh, it's going to seem like to the consumer that development is slowed, despite the fact that we're pushing out builds every day and we're testing stuff and we're, we're working to the bone every day. Once, when, you, when you start to rip that out and replace it, the game no longer is playable. I mean, that, that is every system and mechanic that you interact with as a player. When that's ripped out we have to start plugging things back in and testing things, configuring things for the new system, it's going to take time. Um, and it's not, it's, it's not like we can just, you know, control C, control V, new animation system in, and everything's playable. It is literally a spinal transfusion of the game. Yeah. So it takes it from the, from the point that we merge that into main trunk or which is uh, you look at development uh, as a tree the main trunk and then branches off that people can work on. Once we move that into the main trunk, meaning that is the base of all development internally moving forward, that meant that internally for months, we would not have a playable candidate for months and months. We would not have a playable candidate. Mm -hmm. And as the, uh, you know, as we get closer to having a a playable candidate, you see things like, you know, in the status reports where Eugene was mentioning doing internal tests with weapons uh, on the new player and the new animation system, Mm -hmm. slowly starting to get back to that point. Um, It, you could even say it's, it's, 
to a degree, um, more, I guess you could say, wires behind the stereo that you're messing with than when we replace the render. Because the render, is, it's, it's a visual element, and it interacts with everything you see, but it's not every single every single uh, uh, system mechanic or action you take in the game. And that's the case with the new user actions and player controller and animation system. That is everything you touch when you walk in the game, whether it be pressing W on your keyboard or performing an action, dropping an item on your player, everything mm. is tied to this. So it's, it's a huge undertaking. And do you have the same number of developers on Daisy that you did say two years ago? I think actually we have uh, a little bit more. Okay. That's another thing that people often ask. Because people that have this vision, because it's slow, that they think people have taken off the team, when actually you need more people on the team. Well, I mean, I think we're, we're kind of at critical mass at this point. You know, you, can't, you can only have so many cooks in the kitchen. Yeah. Um, yeah. But adding more people <laughs> does not equal faster development. If that was the case, you'd see, you know, GTA 6 a year after GTA 5 came out. It's just, it's not the case. You, you don't just throw people at it and it goes magically faster. Yeah. It's just not how it works. Yeah. Um, it, 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 like I said, it breaks right down to the massive undertaking that replacing the animation system and user actions and player controller actually is. That takes a lot of time. Yeah. Okay. So I've got some more questions from some of the viewers. Um, Right, so we've got uh, Jeff Bro eighty six. Uh, he asks, "Will there be single player?" Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, that was uh, more the decision of the CEO than it was me or anybody else. But uh, yeah, we announced uh, a single player, like an offline. But single player can have certain connotations. So let me clarify: mm -hmm. there will be an offline local play mode. Yes. Yeah. Are there any plans for battle royale mode? I've just added that one. Uh, the, to the best of my knowledge, that, that would s seem a little odd considering that um, the Survivor games uh, you know, predates uh, the Battle Royale mods for any of the Armour games and is owned by Bohemia. So uh, I would definitely imagine we would see something with the Survivor games given that they bought it. I don't think we'll see anything Battle Royale that would be a little bit redundant. It's like having two DayZ products, you know? Okay, so we've got... Um... <laughs> VK, VCAM ZI Daisy Gameplays has asked, I heard that they will remove the public hive. Is this true? Uh, yes and no. Uh, I've talked a bit about, about that at a couple of the trade shows I was at. Now, not necessarily removing the public hive, but the intent is to segregate uh, the uh, public hive. So that the official Bohemia Interactive servers, the ones run by the company, the ones you know that um, don't have... You know, Jim Bob uh, running it. It is, in fact, really officially BI. Those will be segregated into their own public hive. Now, what, what happens past that? Um, that's, that's more so on production. Um, I personally feel that the public hive should always be there as an option. Um, but uh, it's absolutely critical from my standpoint uh, that official Bohemian Interactive servers are on their own shard, their own public hive from everybody else so that you know what happens on those servers is on those servers. You don't have to worry about some guy running his own private server and trying to loot farm and then have it carry over into the official servers. Yeah. Can't happen. Okay. It should only be Bohemian Interactive run stuff. Yeah, great. Okay, um, as Mondian has come in with, how much relevance do you, the dev team, give to the feedback and suggestions of, the, of Daisy players? Well, actionable feedback, um, like quality feedback where yeah. someone says, you know, yeah, yeah that is is paramount it's always looked at absolutely always mm -hmm. you know sometimes uh, obviously you know if someone has you know recommended something that's outside of scope or just not within the design of daisy uh, we, we can't do it and but you know there's modding is a is a reality for daisy a mandatory reality for any big interactive game mm -hmm. uh so people will have the tools to to do that should they want to do something outside the scope of what we're doing. But as far as ingesting feedback, when, when we get actionable quality feedback, like through the feedback tracker or a post on the forum, it is most definitely looked at. A good example of some quality feedback that's not necessarily bugs would be, uh, have you heard of the YouTuber uh, Credit Red? I think he named his, renamed his channel to Game in Theory, uh, but it used to be known as Credit Red, and he did a lot of suggestions, right. like uh, very well put through suggestions. Guaranteed, them, yeah. the whole team looks at it. Yeah, they're very quality stuff. We most definitely look at that. Whether or not we can act on it is a whole different thing, 
Um, but yes, we, we look at this stuff. And a good example is, you know, uh, Twitch, uh, the amount of time I spend in my off hours watching Twitch streams and, you know, seeing how people play the game and trying to, uh, trying to lurk. I, I, I don't always manage to lurk. Sometimes people call me out, <laughs> but, uh, trying to lurk and just like, I personally, I actually prefer the smaller streamers for this, but lurk in like small streams mm -hmm. and just see how people are playing the game. My favorite would be finding somebody that's never played Daisy before. Yeah. Like a small streamer has got like one viewer, never played Daisy before. I like to sit in there and just watch. Don't I don't talk. I just watch for hours. I'll watch yeah. and see how they see how they relate to the gameplay mechanics, how they figure things out, whether or not there's, you know, a learning curve. There's certain things that um that we just can't do either through mandate from Bohemia corporate or from you know the general game design. Like, you know, there's no tutorials or uh, tool tips, really, in or uh, help tips in in Daisy. Uh, we can't do a wiki because uh, the company doesn't want to do a wiki. So it's it's all about you know trying to make sure that people can through either their own experimentation or common sense figure out these gameplay mechanics. Okay, so that's the first half of the interview. I think you'll have to agree with me that Brian Hicks has been very honest with his opinions. He hasn't held anything back, and he said it how it is. So the second part is coming this weekend. Make sure you subscribe to the channel. Lots of great content. Again, lots of really interesting answers that will shed light on a lot of questions that people have about where Daisy is going. Guys, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.